Thank you, Amy. That was a terrific way to start and a great uh, segue into the material I'll be presenting. So uh, I'm a radiologist, as I said, and run an AI research lab at Stanford and also responsible f uh, with the hospital for the information technology that runs our, our digital radiology practice. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about bridging from the laboratory to the clinical environment. Um, but what I'd really like to do is to give you some tools, some ways to think about uh, AI and machine learning as it applies to diagnostics. Uh, because it's still early days, I think much of this is in the research realm, but we'll begin to see more and more uh, result, uh, results that uh, will impact on our daily work. So I thought I'd start with a clinical case uh, that motivates us a little bit. So this is a 83-year-old woman who uh, had an aortic valve replacement, and uh, she occasionally uh, gets into trouble with congestive heart failure and needs to have a, a chest radiograph. This is a radiograph that she had about uh, two years ago, as red as normal. And this is the radiograph that she had about 18 months later. You can see there's a large mass in the right hemithorax. And if you look back at this prior exam, it's a little unfair in a room with the lights on, but there is a small mass uh, overlying the right hilum, hidden partially by a rib. And so I think you could say that a radiologist on a good day would have seen this mass, but on this particular day, this mass was not detected. So this is exactly one of the reasons why we want to develop these technologies that can help radiologists and pathologists make better diagnoses. OK, so moving on to uh, my disclosure. So I also serve on the board of the RSNA, uh, involved with uh, Nuance, which is a radiology documentation company, two uh, startup uh, AI radiology companies, and research support from the vendors there. So I want to start with just some definitions, because this is an area I know not everyone is familiar with all of these terms. So, so first, um, artificial intelligence. So if you look it up in the dictionary, you'll get something like, when computers do things that make humans seem intelligent. Uh, and uh, the problem with that definition is, number one, it's changing. So back in the 80s, uh, when I trained in AI, it was about uh, planning driving routes, you know, which now is routine on our phone or maybe about playing chess or something like that, whereas today we think about self-driving cars and interpreting chess radiographs. Uh, the other problem with this definition is that there's a lot of uh, anthropomorphic layering that the media and others do that tend to, uh, tends to add meaning that's not there, I think, when we talk about artificial intelligence. <laughs> Machine learning you can think of as a subset of artificial intelligence. So again, back when I trained in AI, they said they were training us to be knowledge engineers. And that meant that we could sit down with a domain expert, let's say a mammographer, someone who reads mammograms, and learn about microcalcifications and speculations and the other features of those images, and then go back and say, well, what computer science techniques do I have that would help me recognize or engineer those features so that I could detect them? And then over a period of two years or four years, I'd get a master's or a PhD, and I would have developed a system that can help you know, a uh, computer detect whether a breast cancer or a breast lesion is uh, benign or malignant. Uh, so the difference today is that what you really can do is you, if you have a large enough data set that's labeled as cancer, no cancer, you can feed it into a machine learning algorithm and it automatically will learn how to detect benign from malignant without all of that human engineering. And that can be done over a weekend or over a week or a couple of weeks. So it's the, the speed and scalability and scope of these systems that's really changed dramatically. And there are a wide variety of machine learning algorithms. So the simplest might be regression, where you feed in data about height and weight of high school kids and you come out with a regression a equation that can predict height from weight. That's really a form of machine learning. But one of the more sophisticated ones that's really developed recently is, are these neural networks. Um, often millions of nodes, each node is really just a small equation, uh, and can learn particularly uh, from data, you know, high data rates from images uh, and other, uh, other sources very rapidly can build detectors and classifiers. Um, they are somewhat of a black box, but again, extremely, uh, extremely powerful. So what's happened over the last few years is that 
Number one, we have lots of data online. Number two, the computing power has advanced tremendously. Uh, and number three, the computer scientists have figured out how you tweak the parameters of these very large mathematical models to make them a little bit better through each iteration, whether the model gets the, gets it, the answer right or wrong, you continue to tweak, and slowly uh, it progresses to become actually quite accurate over time. So that's AI, machine learning, neural networks. Deep learning is just, it's kind of like big data. If you have a neural network that's got a lot of layers, it's very deep, you call it uh, deep learning. How deep is deep? I don't think anyone really knows. Uh, what really uh, got healthcare interested in these techniques is something that happened outside of healthcare, uh, and that is ImageNet. So this is from Fei-Fei Li, who's a professor of computer science at Stanford. She developed a, a database of 14 million photographs from the internet. Uh, each has a dominant object, and each image is labeled with a label from an ontology. Uh, so here we have uh, Ariana Diatomata, which is a garden spider, many different images of the spider from different perspectives, different backgrounds, but always that is the dominant image. So there are 21,000, more than 21,000 distinct labels. You can see more than 800 types of birds. So this is a very complicated data set. And each year, uh, ImageNet holds a competition for computer scientists to see who can more accurately detect the objects in these images. The first year that was done was in 2011, uh, and that was just using those old-fashioned knowledge engineering techniques that I talked about, and you can see the error rate was about 25%. In 2012, a team from the University of Toronto came in with one of these neural networks, and you can see the error rate dropped dramatically. The next year, everyone was using these techniques. A team from NYU won the competition. Then the vendors got into it. Google won it the next year. Microsoft won it the next year. And then what happened was one of Fei-Fei's postdocs decided, I wonder how well a human would do at this task. This is an extremely complicated task. And so he trained himself to learn all of these different species of birds and dogs and everything else. And he found his error rate was about 5%. So we're getting to uh, achieve more than human level performance on this image recognition task. And I think everyone recognized, so this is, this is again the work out of that lab. You can see all of these captions are generated automatically by the computer. So you have bottle of water, cup of coffee, plate of fruit. Uh, and of course, when medical imagers look at this, we say that has obvious implications for what we do, right? That's what I do as a radiologist. I'm looking at an image. I'm trying to put labels on things uh, that are observations I might make about that image. So very powerful techniques. These are the kinds of networks that we're talking about. So each box here has tens of thousands of parameters associated with it. So it's really just a big mathematical model, kind of a black box, which again, can learn. And these, if you look, that model is now on the left of this slide. The early parts of that model do things that we would think of as edge detection or feature detection. You can see the kinds of features that are being detected. And then as you move further and further along in that model to the more advanced uh, parts of it, you see that it's detecting various substructures and superstructures. So uh, what we're doing at Stanford, and I think everybody's got one of these, and Amy just described many of the data aggregation efforts, but is we're, we're building a way to link imaging data to other forms of data, EHR data, omics data, biobank data, through an honest broker with de-identification on the research side, not de-identified on the clinical side, and this is kind of a data commons supported by a set of applications that can be used by researchers and clinicians and others. So what are the key research questions that are being addressed in this form of uh, machine learning research, particularly in radiology and medical imaging? Well, you can start with uh, a set of data. Here we have images and radiology reports or other data from the electronic medical record. And the key is to create a labeled data set for machine learning. And I'll talk to you in a minute about the various labeling methods that we're exploring for this form of data. Then we apply these methods that have been uh, developed outside of medicine for machine learning to create either a classifier or a detector or some combination uh, that can be used as a decision support system in the clinical environment. And then, because these systems are likely to be partnering with the physician, we uh, and other labs are developing explanation methods. So how do we tell which parts of the image are being used to reach a conclusion? And then we think about how, 
how to evaluate these systems once we've built them. So we're going to describe now the work that's going on in each of these areas. So with respect to cohort selection and image labeling, so how do we create the data sets that we need to develop these AI algorithms? Well, this is a, essentially uh, a reverse index search, so a Google-like search of radiology reports. So we can ask the question, how many reports have the words tension, pneumothorax, and the impression? That would create a cohort of data that we could use as positives for a machine learning experiment. We also use other forms of machine learning to identify various aspects of uh, narrative. So here's a radiology report where the blue is an anatomy, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. The green is uh, abnormalities, infiltrates nodules, effusions. The orange is uncertainty. So we can extract various information using natural language processing from the radiology report. We also use techniques. These are rule-based techniques. This is a, a, a something called snorkel, which is developed uh, by uh, a computer scientist, Chris Ray, we can define rules over text. So show me all of the radiology reports that have the word hemorrhage within five words of the word brain. Well, that would be sort of good at detecting brain hemorrhage, uh, but not great. So we can define a set of rules and using synonyms and different uh, distances and so on. And then uh, this algorithm will look at the correlations and conditional dependencies between those results and come up with a single best rule to identify a brain hemorrhage. So that's very quick. Not perfect, but uh, very, very efficient. And then, of course, you can use these same large neural networks to do text processing as well. So many are experimenting with uh, deep learning to classify uh, radiology reports and other documents. So that really just gets to this notion. So what about all of these techniques are not perfect, right? So how is it that we're going to teach a, an algorithm to uh, detect something on an image when we don't have perfect labeling of that image? And this gets to the notion of what uh, computer scientists call weak labeling. And I'm just going to describe to you why that's a very powerful concept. So here we have a set of images and a set of documents that might describe the, sort of the truth of those with, of those images, whether it's the chart or the report. And we do, in fact, develop training sets using uh, radiologists, other human experts, to decide what's in that image. Does it show a hemorrhage? Does it not show a hemorrhage? That's a very labor-intensive process. But let's say that we did that, and then we fed those labeled images into a convolutional neural network. That's CNN here, one of these neural networks. And we've developed then a machine learning system that can classify these images with 85% accuracy. Just Then we apply one of these weak labelers that have some uncertainty associated with the labeling. We can label the same 1,000 cases. The labels are not going to be as accurate as the human labels, the gold standard labels. And because they're not as accurate, the classifier that we build based on that labeled data is also going to be less accurate than the original classifier. So here we have 83% accuracy versus 85% accuracy. But the power of the weak labeling is because it's automated. Now I can label 100,000 cases, not 1,000 cases. And the power of the variety of data that we're pulling in and uh, the ability that, uh, that these models are data hungry and, and need very large data sets um, means that often a, even a weak labeled system will perform more accurately than a human labeled system with uh, lower numbers of labeled cases. So very powerful concept. You still need the human label, the gold standard label, to validate the system, but to train the system, you can use those weak labels. All right, so some examples. This is the work of uh, David Larson, who you heard uh, from yesterday. Uh, this is a, one of the first networks that many people build because it, it involves planar, single planar images, much like the work that was done outside of uh, medicine. So this is bone age. Take an x-ray of the patient's hand for children with developmental delay. You look at the bone maturity, and you can decide approximately what the patient's age is. And that helps, you know, chronologic versus physiologic age helps to assess for developmental delay. The state of the art for doing this today is a book. So you look at the pictures in the book. You see which picture in the book matches your x-ray. You say that's about the same. This patient must be seven and a half years old. Uh, and uh, the, the, the reference data in this book was uh, developed from 300 Caucasian children in Cleveland in 1950s. So uh, we thought this was a ripe area for application of one of these models. Uh, these are the results. These numbers are mean absolute difference from the <laughs> reference standard. So smaller is better here. And you can see on the, uh, the model is the lower uh, row here. And the upper row is 
uh, four radiologist readings, and you can see that the model's performing about the same as two radiologists, perhaps slightly better than two others. So it's human-level performance that we're getting here. One of the reasons that I showed you this example, even though it's not a cancer example, is that, uh, ah, and these are the, what I was talking about earlier, these saliency maps that can help to explain the results. So this shows which pixels are being used, and looking at the joints of the wrist and the hand, that makes a lot of sense to a radiologist. That's the, those are the areas that matter when we're uh, rating these images. But the reason I show you this is you can imagine now building a separate model for different demographic groups. So now you can build a precision uh, bone age uh, evaluator uh, that has the right answer for, for everyone, not just based on uh, a particular demographic group. This is work in chest radiography, the work of Matt Lundgren and Andrew Ng's lab. Uh, this is based on 100,000 chest x-rays labeled with very weak labels from the NIH. Uh, and you can see, again, human near human level performance, and several models have achieved quite good uh, performance. These are accuracy numbers on this data set. Particularly oncology examples here, nodule pneumonia. This is also some really fascinating work out of Brad Erickson's lab at the Mayo Clinic, uh, very early work, but correlating image features to MGMT methylation, so genomic signatures. And the, the ACE, uh, area under the ROC curve here is only 0.72, but getting to where accuracy would be interesting. I've listed on the right the features, if you want to call them that. So these are not features that humans would normally describe, right? So some of these, they put words on them, like cluster shade is, had to do with the skewness of the data in the image matrix. Not something that a radiologist would think of looking at the image, but it's interesting that there may be some signal in these images that we're not detecting with the human eye and that may correlate directly with genomic signature, and that would uh, really change the way that we stage cancer. Uh, this is an image, uh, this is an image enhancement task. So on the, uh, on the left here is a longer MR sequence called arterial spin labeling of the brain. On the right is a shorter sequence, same type of sequence. And a neural network was used combining the spin labeling data with the anatomic data from other, other sequences, the T1-weighted, the proton density, to create a synthetic image that's very close to this high signal to noise. So we're reducing the imaging time to get the same quality image. You can imagine this applied to CT, reducing radiation dose. He's, uh, this is Greg Zaharchuk, a uh, neuroradiologist. You can imagine um, he's done some work in PET to predict the 100% dose from the 1% dose and has some very interesting results. So there's a real possible dose reduction angle here. These are just the difference maps showing that, in fact, there is a, a noise reduction happening with these neural networks. So very interesting image production task. Okay, so what are the opportunities? We talked about efficient image creation just now. Image quality control. So we have patients who are on the scanner, maybe moving, breathing. The images aren't very good. Technologists may not notice it. I, as a radiologist, notice that two hours later, the patient's at home. They've excreted the contrast. They have to be called back. Nobody's happy. It takes up another slot. Inconvenient, twice the parking for the patient, and so on. Uh, triage. So I get 100 ICU films every morning. Five of them might have a problem with the tube out of place, pneumonia, line out of place. Uh, be nice for those to be popped to the top of the stack so I look at them right away rather than at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, Computer-aided detection would help us with the case I showed early, early on. Computer-aided classification. This is a radiologist out of his or her comfort zone. So uh, I'm a chest radiologist. If I see something in the bone, uh, be nice to put a circle around that and show me a differential diagnosis, show me another case that was, and how that was uh, dictated. And then radiogenomics, the kinds of things that I showed you with Brad Erickson's work, correlating the images to genomic signatures. These models have challenges. So uh, just a couple slides on the challenges. A lot of this work is done with self-driving cars. Uh, Someone found that if you place these black and white rectangle stickers on stop signs, the neural network models no longer recognize them as stop signs. Okay, so they're, we call this a brittleness effect. So the need for clinical validation is still very important. Uh, Google has found that if you put this little round multicolored sticker on any image, it classifies that image as a toaster. <laughs> okay. So there you see the result. So again, you know, these are black boxes. We don't understand how they're working. We need to validate them. 
All right, so uh, just to conclude, uh, some of the take-home lessons. You can see that this is really going to revolutionize the way imagers practice. We're going to get new tools, new autopilot, if you will. Uh, so radiologists and pathologists are going to be need, need to be trained on how to use these techniques. Just as we were trained on the physics of MR, we know the artifacts and when to believe it, when not to believe it. We need to be trained on how these techniques, when they work, when they don't work. Uh, we will need new machine learning methods. So our data is quite different than a photograph from the web. So the neural network models that have been developed thus far don't always work on 3D, multimodality, time-based data, and some of the complex high-resolution data that we see in medicine. Uh, we need automated labeling methods. We need, as I say, these new model structures for the high-dimensional data. And we need ways to help these models explain why they came to the conclusions that they did. Uh, the data-driven organizations are going to thrive, so do organizations that treat this kind of data as an asset to help them develop these machine learning tools, to help them uh, with their practice and make it more precise, are really going to thrive in this environment. Uh, we need data linked across data types, as we've shown. Um, and so cancer, uh, organizations that can develop this kind of virtuous loop where they continue to learn from the additional data that they produce are going to be the ones that succeed. And then I think, as Amy said, uh, sharing of training data sets is going to accelerate progress. No single organization, particularly for low prevalence conditions, is going to uh, have all the training data needed to develop the kinds of systems that are going to uh, make the maximum impact. And as I said, we'll always need a subset of cases that have uh, very nice, high-quality labels to validate these systems. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.